welcome Dr. Umberto La Roche from Cisco, who has accepted our invitation to come along and speak to us about 5G architecture and emergence of the edge. I would like to briefly introduce him. He is a principal engineer in Cisco's mass scale infrastructure group, where he's responsible for the 5G solution architecture. He has a multi-decade career in the telecoms industry, and he has worked on a number of commercial products that we see today. He's listed as an inventor on over 20 patents and several technical papers. He has a PhD degree in physics from the University of Texas at Austin. Umberto, you're very welcome on behalf of Lena and myself and the other organizers of ICFEC. And it's over to you and we look forward to hearing you. Well, thank you very much, Blesson and Lena. Let's uh, take the opportunity to do a sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent, thank you. So yes, indeed, uh, thank you very much for the invite. It's uh, my pleasure to be here and to speak to you about a topic that I feel passionate about. Um, I've often I've been interested in the connection between mobile architectures and edge computing for a long time. And I think that 5G actually gets us to the point where I can actually persuade some of you that there is a very strong connection between the nature of the evolving 5G architecture and some of the business drivers for edge computing. The way in which I would like to do so is by highlighting, first of all, 5G transformation in, uh, in Umberto, just a second. Uh, can you please share your slides because we shared ours. Okay. Ah, that, that would be, of course, very important. <laughs> so, so thank you very much for that. Let me um, let me uh, figure out how to do this. Um, and I think that I know how because you taught me how to do this before. Can, can you confirm that you see my slides? Yes, just, okay. um, yeah, put it on Excellent. the screen Thank mode you. and then we are. Okay, so let me make them bigger. And I, I would assume that uh, you can see my slides in, in, in the right size on your computer screens. Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. So, um, the, the way I've organized the presentation is by first discussing 5G transformation, by first explaining what we are seeing in the market regarding the introduction of 5G. And I, I want to make the point up front that the 5G transformation actually involves the edge in a very compelling way. Then I want to speak about some of the mechanics of how that 5G transformation is occurring. And that leads me naturally into something called ORAN, the Open RAN initiative that is being pursued by several operators and by several standards development organizations. How do you realize the infrastructure at the edge? I think is very important. By infrastructure, I mean the collection of resources that you use to build a network, including a 5G mobile network by way of example. And so I'd like to illustrate very specifically some of the problems that uh, the industry has had to solve and that we've had to address in connection with developing edge computing in the context of a 5G network infrastructure. Now, edge computing is all about developing compelling services and capabilities. And there is a spectrum of service models for edge here I'd like to share with you some of our learnings regarding some of those surveyed service models, what we have learned regarding the business context that shapes the technology that ultimately gets deployed as part of the edge. And then let's wrap up with a summary. So let's begin with the topic of 5G transformation. And I'd like to get to the punchline as soon as possible so that you can understand what I'm talking about. In the upper half of this picture, you have a classic LTE, and for that matter, prior G mobile network infrastructure. In that mobile network, 
you have a context that is actually very simple to explain. You have a monolithic base station deployed at the cell site, and you have a basically monolithic packet core that is deployed at a centralized location. Simple enough, worked very well up to the time of LTE, certainly was deployed in the context of 3G and, and 2G. And now what we're discovering in the context of uh, 5G infrastructure is that the base station is basically decomposed and that the packet core is in fact decomposed as well. And as part of that decomposition, elements of the packet core migrate closer to the edge downstream and elements of the base station migrate upstream to just about the same location, which is indicated in the rectangle in this uh, lower half of the picture. So you see that in a 5G network, the decomposition of the infrastructure drives elements of the mobile core, elements of the base station kind of coming together at a place that we'll see ultimately corresponds to the edge. In addition to that, Operators are saying that, uh, hey, perhaps it would be a good idea for them to buy software separate from hardware and therefore disaggregate the notion of how they build networks into separate procurement decisions. That drives the cloud infrastructure at the end. And so very often we're finding that the question that operators are most frequently asking is, hey, now that I have to deploy a cloud for the edge-based infrastructure associated to 5G, can I figure out how to leverage that infrastructure for other services, perhaps gaming, perhaps caching, perhaps other closed loop latency, low latency use cases? And that's part of the thinking that we're seeing right now. But in doing so, we're also seeing the emergence of an entire ecosystem associated to edge computing because operators are realizing that they cannot do this alone. And so, for example, as part of the edge based infrastructure, they realize that they're not going to be the innovators associated to applications and use cases. So, in a sense, they need to expose their network as a service capability, as a platform to be used by developers so that they can build these compelling applications. But then enter the public cloud providers that are also realizing that they have standard APIs and standard frameworks that are today being used by developers so that you can build applications and so that you can build use cases. Enter the owners of real estate at the edges tower providers, co-location providers that are, are realizing that there is value to their geographical location. Because at those locations where they have real estate, where they have power, where they have connectivity, you can build edge-based infrastructure. Enter IP transport providers who are realizing that the infrastructure to provide connectivity is hugely important for edge computing or CDN operators who are realizing that their infrastructure is likely to be deployed in an edge compute environment more often than not. And so as part of this, we see the emergence of an infrastructure where we are conjecturing that the IP network will play a very strong role for reasons that I'll explain and for reasons that will hopefully help you understand why my employer, Cisco Systems, is very interested in edge computing. So let's talk a little bit about ORAN and virtualized RAN so that uh, we can appreciate further the context for the type of transformation that occurs in connection with, with uh, uh, edge computing. And one of the things that you'll notice on this slide is uh, the initiative known as ORAN. On the left-hand side of the picture, you have basically a block diagram of a monolithic base station that basically encompasses all the layers of the signal processing stack all the way up from where layer three is, where the IP network layer is, 
down to the physical layer in essentially one box, one chassis, one construct, where you might, for example, deploy a modem cards, but it's essentially all self-contained, baseband, radio, OANM, all within the context of one infrastructure. The ORAN initiative is built on the assumption that there is more value that can be extracted out of a 5G environment by decomposing that monolithic base station into elements that can be, for example, procured and deployed separately. For example, elements where the software can be procured separately from the hardware. Therefore, where the software can, deployed, can be deployed in virtualized fashion over hardware. And what you see on the right hand is the ORAN decomposition associated to a traditional base station, which requires modular standard interfaces that describe how those various modules interconnect in a standard fashion. So that if you're in the business of building mobile networks, you now have to make sure that you comply with these standards that define the way these interfaces work so that you can put together a network. And so those elements introduce new capabilities, new modular capabilities within the mo mobile network that I'll show in the next slide. The radio, for example, and here on the right-hand side of the picture, you have uh, the uh, mobile device as such, but you also have the radios, the so-called radio units, where the digital to analog conversion into RF is performed in the downlink direction and where the reverse is performed in the uplink direction. Those radio units contain the amplification, the filtering, the, the capabilities that help you create a good waveform that you can deliver to multiple devices off of your um, cell site. But then you have the scheduling functions, the all important scheduling functions those go into something called the distributed unit that includes basically the radio link control layers, the MAC functions, and the upper layers of the PHY, where you do um, uh, functions associated to the signal processing stack. And then in a more centralized location, you might deploy something called a centralized unit that includes layer three, that includes the upper layers of layer two, something called the PDCP layer, something new that is being introduced in 5G called SDAP, as Service Delivery Adaptation Protocol. And those modular, inter, modular functions are interconnected via well-defined, very precise standard interfaces that are defined as part of this ORAN uh, SDO set of specifications. And you can now build the RAN if you adhere to these specifications in, in a manner such that we're presumably you can mix and match vendors in a manner that uh, I'll hope to show in just a little bit. But it's also important to highlight that there is a role for innovation and creativity as part of these standards. Because by way of example, machine learning occupies a special role in the definition of the ORAN specifications. And uh, you have initiatives where uh, within ORAN and within 3GPP and GMN and ITU, uh, you, you are able to create a framework for use cases that rely on machine learning where data is presented. And off of that data, you can perform a training function that will allow you to improve the overall quality of the radio. And that uh, uh, drives you into something called a, uh, a RAN intelligent controller vision, where the RAN intelligent controller is actually defined as part of uh, two separate uh, functions that uh, one operates uh, near real time, the other one is uh, non real time where you can map a variety of machine learning types of use cases. Um, the central point that I'm driving here is that with infrastructure, you're getting to the point 
where you already have a mechanism for differentiation and for innovation built in as part of 5G. And it was no longer possible. And it was not possible to have this kind of capability with prior G generations. So how do you realize this edge infrastructure within the context of 5G? Well, uh, ORAN macro, for example, in an ORAN macro environment, you might deploy a set of centralized functions in a cloud. That is the edge cloud that I showed you in my very first slide that includes basically the elements of the base station that are decomposed and are now deployed upstream. But it also includes the elements of the mobile core, such as the anchoring function about which I will say more a little later, the user plane function, where now I have the ability to expose the IP address of mobile devices. So in fact, off of this cloud, I can deliver services because I have visibility into the IP addresses of the elements on, on the left-hand side. But that's not what I hope to highlight about this slide. What I hope to highlight about this slide is really what I think is a fundamental message about the 5G architecture and why it is superior to 4G. And it is this, it is that the 5G architecture represents a comprehensive mechanism for spectrum management versus prior Gs uh, such as LTE. And in this particular example, I show and illustrate how different types of spectrum, low band spectrum at the top, mid band spectrum in the middle, and then frequency range two millimeter wave spectrum, and then heterogeneous networking with small cells, all work within the context of a system where you can enable different forms of spectral access into devices, and where you can leverage as a way of almost defeating Shannon's limit, uh, using multi-band connectivity to aggregate and bond different bands together. Of course, you can't defeat Shannon's limit. Shannon's capacity is one of the fundamental laws of information theory, but you can go around it by leveraging multiple spectrum bands and the ability of modern mo modem chipsets to aggregate multiple spectral bands in the context of things like carrier aggregation and dual connectivity, which are essential intrinsic parts of uh, 5G specifications. Same architecture applies for indoor. So you can now build an architecture that reconciles outdoor with indoors using small cells, using densification, using distributed antenna systems, and basically providing ubiquitous connectivity both indoor and outdoor. Now, here's where it starts getting into interesting in the context of uh, edge computing. When, I, when we build the, these type of 5G networks, it's important to keep in mind where you have packet awareness, where you can actually see an IP packet so you can do something to it or so you can inject services or you can build mobile edge computing. What's interesting about 5G networks developed this way is that the CUs, the centralized units, can now be deployed at metro regional infrastructures. And I show here four typical examples of metro regional infrastructure, ring based, dual home, mesh, and uh, mesh core, ring core. These are various examples of mesh-based infrastructure, what they all have in common in the context of the 5G architecture is that you can deploy the places where you have packet visibility within that core. And that's important because one of the messages that I'd like to highlight is that the natural location for edge computing within the context of 5G networking is not the base station as such. You don't have packet visibility there. You have encrypted uh, baseband signals. You have no way of accessing the packet. 
but where you do have access to uh, packet networking is in the in these regional networks. And that we shall be able to draw some conclusions out of this uh, in, in the context of what comes later. But now I, I wish to slightly shift attention to the, to the packet core. Because remember, at the very beginning, we talked about two types of transformation. Number one, transformation in the base station. The base station is decomposed. And we've spoke at length about that. But now there's another type of transformation occurring with the packet core. The packet core becomes decomposed. And what you see at the, in the top picture is basically a mobile packet core that is decomposed into a control plane and user plane functions. The user plane functions you can deploy anywhere the IP network allows. And that gives you value because it means that you now have the flexibility from the architectural point of view of putting user plane functions that have the role of advertising reachability to the IP address of the mobile device anywhere you want. Therefore, edge compute. Now using the mobile core, you can control IP mobility. And this is very important. This is work that we did um, and that we demonstrated in the context of LTE. And I'd like to speak a little bit to this um, by, by explaining what I mean by mobility management and mobility functions within the packet core. So very simplified view of what a mobile core does. Begin with um, a mobile device shown on the left. And it has an IP address represented by a red dot. That reachability to that IP address is advertised by an anchor, which corresponds to a user plane function in a mobile core. And so if you want to reach that IP address in IP next hop routing, routers are, you know, are told in a conventional fashion that they need to go through this IP address first. And then the mobile network is essentially a tunnel connecting the anchor to the mobile device that follows you anywhere you go. That in essence is what the mobile core does in connection with RAN and that is in essence, the mobility function in the mobile packet core. It's a tunnel that follows you around, tunnel terminated on the mobile device and then on the other hand, terminated at uh, the mobility anchor. And, and therefore you are reachable from anywhere on the internet. So, so we built a test bed because uh, you know, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to explore what happens with edge computing when this tunnel's following you around. So imagine the following thought experiment, pick two cities. Because, because I'm local to New York City, I'm gonna pick New York City. And because I'm gonna to drive to Washington DC for whatever reason, I'm gonna get in my car. And uh, imagine that I have uh, young children in the back seat of my car and that I'd like to keep them entertained. And that I think that uh, you know the 5G network is a good way of entertaining them. What I'd like to do is explore the implications of traversing um, you know, multiple cell sites, multiple regions as I drive from New York City into Washington, DC. That normally is about a four hour trip. Uh, so I can expect, uh, you know, a significant number of base stations. If I drive at say 55 miles per hour, I'm likely to do a handover less than, you know, more than once every minute. Now, the conventional way in which mobility works is illustrated here. Imagine that I'm on a phone call, just for the sake of argument. Voice is not a mobility, is not a latency sensitive service in the sense that, uh, you know, 200 milliseconds as per ITUT is easily tolerable by any kind of modern IP network and by any kind of modern um, um, LTE or 5G scenario. So I get on my car and uh, you know, I decide that I need to join a work conference call. As I hand over from one cell site to another, my mobility anchor deployed in a centralized location will hand over traffic and I'll support an IMS infrastructure 
that will ensure that I remain connected as I drive through. So you can think of the tunnel that I showed you a few slides ago as pivoting on this centralized location where the IMS is. So this tunnel is following you around as you drive from New York to Washington, DC. And I can do that because it's not a latency sensitive service. So mobility on IMS is uh, you know, very, very simple. I connect to the IMS. And when I arrive in Washington, DC four hours later, because my conference call lasted for four hours, I'm still connected uh, to uh, the same user plane function that advertises my reachability to the IMS, all is fine and well. But what happens to my kids in the backseat of the car? You know, I've been trying to keep them entertained with cartoons and other things of that nature. Well. Uh, it's a different situation. What I'd like to do is assign them a geographically appropriate anchor for every uh, suitable regional location in the course of the drive from New York to Washington, D.C. So imagine here that I have two locations. Uh, I'm connected at user plane function uh, to the internet and uh, I drive, but I do a handover as mobile stations are designed to hand over. And uh, I end up with uh, something that is, is not quite uh, what I would want to, what I would want to ensure in terms of a constant anchor. What I would want to do is to make sure that I get a geographically appropriate user plane function. And I know I can do that. And we worked out how to do that in the context of LTE, and that became a standard as part of 5G. And it, it, it allows us to select a geographically appropriate user plane function, no matter where we are in our trajectory. And we can deal with IMS and with internet sessions at the same time. So here's our takeaways. We can get the network to select a geographically appropriate IP anchor, a UPF at the edge, but we still need to worry about selecting a uh, CDN node that's geographically appropriate. And so we figured out how to do that with, uh, with, uh, by providing the mobile device a new destination IP via centralized server in a CDN, it occurs naturally. Um, and what we have learned, it's sort of interesting. When we change the underlying IP address in the client side protocol stack, most modern applications do not care if the underlying IP address changes. We did a demo with uh, Netflix, with Hulu. Again, remember, I'm streaming to the back seat of the car. And in every single case, we found that there was no impact to the quality of experience if I changed the IP address. YouTube, just about every single, uh, every single streaming video that we played out was able to behave appropriately in the context of underlying IP addresses because developers have figured out how to handle IP address changes in the protocol stack. And we found that this was true for even uh, VPN software. The only example where it didn't work, frankly, was uh, the Cisco video player software stack. It didn't work. We fixed it within a week. It was a simple fix. Mobility in terms of IP address preservation is no longer that important. It is possible to reconcile mobility with edge computing. And I think this gives rise to the uh, 3GPP 5G service and session continuity specs. Uh, this was a contribution that we presented to standards and, uh, you know, it got standardized. So back to my scenario where I'm driving from New York City to Washington, D.C., I can always pick a low latency edge compute server, even though I'm driving and I'm changing location all the time. And it doesn't matter because application developers have built immunity to IP address changes and because the 5G network is capable of ensuring that you are always 
using a geographically appropriate PDU, um, geographically appropriate user plane function answer. Important lesson there. Let's talk about uh, the spectrum of service models for edge computing. Um, edge computing, as you might know, is uh, about all about disrupting the cloud, uh, reducing latency and controlling jitter, and then managing volume through data reduction. Milliseconds matter. Uh, it's uh, not about nanoseconds. It's not about seconds. It's about milliseconds. And so when we look at edge computing, we explore the variety of use cases that uh, make sense within the context of edge computing. And we find that almost invariably, uh, the unit, the figure of merit is measured in milliseconds. And so that's an important consideration from a design point of view. Um, the other, of course, important uh, revelation is that the location of the edge and the way you manage quality of service at the edge will depend on use case and is determined by, you know, an incontrollable, an uncontrollable element and an irreducible element. First of all, uh, just some plain physics for you here. Um, there are some common beliefs that are not true, in my opinion. One common belief equates proximity to low latency. I don't think so. We are at the point where the speed of light prevents low latency delivery. No, I don't think so. Look at it from this point of view. The reality is that in modern networks today, queuing network, queuing delay resulting from IP packets that are uh, scheduled in an access node and result in uh, stat muxing and IP is much more meaningful than the speed of light propagation. Queuing, queuing IP is common practice in IP networks today because of statistical multiplexing. It's common practice in schedulers, in base stations, and for that matter, and any other access node. Because when you get these surges of bandwidth, the only thing you've got to do is to queue those surges of bandwidth until you have bandwidth, until you have throughput available to deliver those packets. From a speed of light point of view, five microseconds per kilometer, that's it, results in one millisecond delay uh, for 200 kilometers of uh, fiber distance. So what this is teaching us is that from the point of view of access networks in general and 5G networks specifically, the optimal location for edge node, if you believe my thesis that, uh, that uh, suitable latencies are measured in milliseconds are regional networks. The other important thing to emphasize in the context of edge computing is that enterprises are willing to pay extra for low latency and controllable jitter. This is unassailably the fundamental pivotal assumption regarding edge computing from a business point of view, that there are entities, people that are willing to pay extra for low latency. Let's think about it. The massive scale data center is by far the optimal infrastructure for delivering workloads from the cloud because you have everything at scale. You have space, power, cooling, connectivity, all available at scale, at a, at a hyperscale data center. Edge computing cannot be that way because the locations, the regional locations in the middle of our cities where one would deploy a massive scale data center are simply not there. So it's gonna be more expensive. So there has to be a willingness to pay extra, meaning that we need to test use cases against the need for edge compute. Because if they don't pass the needs test, they won't get deployed at the edge. They will be deployed instead at mass scale data, data centers. Mercifully, however, there's enough evidence to suggest that there are use cases 
that people will pay for in the context of a mass scale data center. Those include 5G infrastructure, the things that I've talked about. Video streaming and live content um, actually benefits from low latency. We've, uh, I'm personally convinced of that. Uh, we've done studies that show that. We've had collaborative studies with universities that uh, demonstrate that that is the case. Connected cars for situational awareness and telemetry also uh, suggest that in a very compelling way, low latency use cases are important. And then uh, have a conversation with a gamer. I'm not, I'm not a gamer myself, but uh, these are people that uh, understand low latency and they are, they're willing to pay extra uh, for low latency uh, because uh, the gaming use cases are very important for them. We see two types of use case families uh, that in, in the context of 5G that are driven by the location of the radio. On the one hand, you have wide area use cases. Wide area use cases are associated with things like electrical grid automation, connected cars, oil and gas field, mining, content delivery. And these are use cases where the enterprise, the party paying extra for the edge service, wishes to see the network as an extension of their own network as a way of reaching those devices that they are interested in, in observing. And in doing so, consume a product by an operator that allows them to see that kind of service delivery benefit. So workload latency should include in those cases an edge cloud for optimal delivery. And then you have local area use cases where latency is also a factor, but where other factors come into play, such as data sovereignty, uh, protection and security, and, and the need to support private radio use cases, such as, for example, for factory automation and that kind of um, industry 4.0 type of uh, use case. And so we see private 5G solutions emerging. Uh, we're, we're actually spending quite a bit of time on these private 5G solutions will probably have an enterprise uh, component as well as a wide area component. Um, there's no question that, uh, uh, that there is no, there is no one size fits all scenario here. Uh, there's a significant amount of domain expertise that is needed. Um, you know, my employer knows a lot about IP networking, for example, but uh, it's fair to say that uh, uh, when it comes to healthcare use cases, we need to partner, we need to figure out. When it comes to industry 4.0 use cases, we need to partner. It's an ecosystem-based approach. And I think it's also very clear that the role of the public cloud here is uh, indisputable. The public cloud provides APIs that give you the ability to deploy workloads. And those APIs are known by developers and are known by uh, many people. And uh, so therefore, uh, you know, it's safe to assume that we will rely on it. Uh, 5G industry, 5G infrastructure use cases are two kinds. Cloud RAN workloads per the ORAN architecture, for example, just by way of example and then decomposed mobile core use cases where user plane functions are deployed at edge locations for benefit. And then there's also service use cases. And some of you, I assume, are uh, bigger experts in this than I would ever hope to be. Um, but we've attempted to basically build a taxonomy and it includes uh, you know, what you might expect, AR, VR, fog computing, connected and autonomous vehicles, gaming and virtual reality, as well as content streaming, which, which is one that from our point of view was probably uh, one of the key ones initially in this market. As part of the business, we need to be thinking of target customers. And uh, by target customers, I mean here, who's gonna pay extra? for edge compute services. And so we see network operator infrastructure uh, entities uh, 
uh, we saw a good example of this, a major um, upstart mobile operator in the United States um, signed up with a hyperscaler to build mobile infrastructure in hyperscale public cloud data centers. Then you've got mass market providers, gaming companies, gaming studios are very keen to have access at low latency to customers who are willing to pay extra for that low latency. Enterprise verticals, municipal, auto vendors, IoT, consumers, oil and gas, industry 4.0, examples that I've illustrated before. And then a new type of target edge customer is a federator or service aggregator, which might be, for example, a hyperscale public cloud. And the benefit and value add that they provide is to build uh, basically pods for their data center infrastructure that are embedded within the edge compute environments. Uh, for an operator so that an enterprise customer can use edge compute transparently through, through that environment. An example of this might be a public cloud provider that deploys pods within an operator infrastructure and then makes those pods available via their standard APIs. And so there's a complete taxonomy of edges that includes uh, uh, use cases uh, relative to the value. And uh, I, I firmly believe that uh, we need to be very clear in terms of what the value of the edge is when we state that a use case maps to an edge computing application. It could be, for example, latency reduction. It could be, for example, a personalized user experience that's available only through the context of edge computing. Security services are some that have popped up and uh, have uh, become important in the context of several discussions. Data reduction, a uh, major fog, fog use case where uh, rather than transporting all the telemetry back to a centralized location, uh, you may decide to actually process all that data at the edge and then transport the reduced data or even federated machine learning as some have discussed. Um, there's obviously the, the infrastructure use cases that I've discussed uh, in the context of uh, 5G infrastructure and then peer-to-peer -peer communications, which may become very important, particularly in the context of first responder networks and emergency services. So let, let me wrap it up uh, with a summary. We see the following use case categories. We see infrastructure use cases, which provide an operator with resources by means of which they can create edge services. Uh, an example of this would be 5G infrastructure. Then we see operator branded services. An operator might decide, for example, that they'd like to run their own CDN. And then they build a CDN within their network and that CDN leverages edge compute locations. A third category might be services to business enterprises. And that would include uh, capabilities that are supported by hyperscale public cloud providers. And the model here is business to business where the operator provides a wholesale capability to a federator such as uh, you know, a public cloud provider who in turn offers services to business. So B to B to B, if you will. And then there's private radio for enterprise, which is an emerging uh, service model associated to edge computing. Uh, where the value of the radio is intimately connected with the value of the capability deployed at, uh, at the enterprise, in service of the enterprise. 5G transformation, and this is my main thesis, is creating real opportunity for infrastructure and services edge. I see all the conversations that we're a part of, this is the main topic. 
this is uh, this is a key element of our conversational dynamics uh, as we attempt to discover value within edge computing. And I, I see ORAN in particular and RAN decomposition as facilitating the emergence of this uh, edge infrastructure. Mobile core decomposition, same thing. You need to create packet awareness, uh, visibility into those packets. And you do that by moving that element of the mobile core to the edge cloud, that element being the mobility anchor or user plane function. There are flexible definitions of what mobility is via 3GPP service and session continuity modes that I've highlighted in this presentation. And then software virtualization and cloud computing go hand in hand. Uh, the, the, the impact that the cloud will have on networking, not a matter of dispute anymore, it's just a fact. And we're all hurrying up to figure it out. As far as edge products is, is concerned, I see significant value in observing that edge compute is primarily consumed by other companies, not consumers. You know, even in the gaming scenario that I talked about, edge compute will be offered to a gaming studio who will in turn package that capability and deliver it to us. And so understanding that value chain becomes a fundamental component of edge computing. And finally, the edge can be network-based or premises-based. There are distinctions and there are differences in the business model. With that, uh, happy to entertain some questions and any comments that you might have. Thank you.